shepherd. Good morning. Well, if you know me, you'll know I am loving these cooler temperatures. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us start today off with prayer. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we are so privileged to be here in your house today to worship you. And as we encounter the change of seasons, Lord, we are so grateful that we don't have to expect a change in you. Because you are the same, Lord, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And for that, we give you thanks. Be with us this day as we prepare to worship your holy and precious name. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship as found in your bulletin and on the screen. In a world that understands the power of dominance, the power of the last word, the power of being the alpha in the room, may God show us power of a different sort, the power of trust, the power of hope, the power of faith in the Lord. In this gathering, may such power be made known. Please remain standing as we sing, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, number 514 in your hand. <laughs>
Let us bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Holy God, word made flesh, let us come to this word open to being surprised. Silence our agendas, banish our assumptions, cast out our casual detachment, confound our expectations, clear the cobwebs from our ears, penetrate the corners of our hearts with this word. We know that you can, we pray that you will, and we wait with great anticipation. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading today may be found in 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verses 31 through 40. May God's blessing be upon the reading and hearing of these words. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been fighting, keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defiled the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around, because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in his pouch of his shepherd's bag, and his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Take a moment and pray with me, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be pleasing unto you. Fill my lungs with your breath my mouth with your message, and let all that I say and all that I do bring honor and glory to you and to you alone. I ask all things in the name of the risen Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So familiar story today, right? David and Goliath. How God used this brave young man full of faith to face a huge hulk of a human for God and his people, Israel. Had a sling in his hand, he chose the five smooth stones from the brook, and he yells, charge, as he runs into the valley, a certain death sentence waiting. But God guided his actions, and the stone, well, we, as we know, the stone went right between the eyes of the giant who fell flat. Today, we're continuing our series called We Are Called. Last week, we talked about how how, how do we hear God's call? And we question, are we really willing to be able to listen when God does call us? Well, today I want to talk about making sure that we're equipped to answer that call when we receive it and when we are willing to hear it. This passage shares how David was equipped he had had prior experiences that might have seemed unrelated at the time, but he had the experience to take on this challenge of battling Goliath. While David was not at this point an experienced warrior, we know that, he did, <clears throat> what it, he did know what it was like to be the protector. Right? He protected his flock from the predators, just as Israel needed protection from Goliath. Like David, we too are called to stay the path that God has set for us. This does not mean that our path or our direction never changes because Lord knows it does. Amen? Amen. Amen. But rather that we always need to be paying attention to whether these changes and challenges that are coming at us, are they coming from God or are they coming from somewhere else? 
David would not be deterred just because Saul did not think he was capable of battling Goliath. He did not let Saul's opinion deter his call. Like David, each one of us is unique. Each one of us will have our own God-given way to fill our God-given call. Now, while emulating or copying others can be helpful, we need to stay on our own path, the one God sets for us. David couldn't wear the armor that was meant for Saul, as it said in verses uh, 38 to 41. Right, he tried, made me think of the, um, the little boy when he gets the snowsuit on, right? And he's walking like this. David wasn't used to all this equipment that Saul thought he should wear. He had to battle this Goliath his own way. God gave David the wisdom. God gave David the strength. God showed David how to stay on the path that was specifically marked out for him and him alone just like God will do for us, as we continually seek God's guidance amid the pressure and influence from others. Confidence is the key to following your purpose and call. But confidence in what? Confidence in who? First and foremost, David had great confidence in God. You see, God was the source of his power, and he knew that. From within this space of confidence in God, David also recognized the gifts that God had given him. And he was able and willing to execute those gifts. God used all of David's experiences as a shepherd to help him face this battle against Goliath. God will use our experiences that made us who we are as we are called to face new things. And that means our experiences that are good and our experiences that aren't so good because we've all had those as well. God has prepared and God is preparing us for things to come. Our worldly experiences can be used for God within the church and outside of the church. David's example shows us about the relationship between faith and call. Calling is a journey. You see, David's faith was what gave him the strength for the moment. David knows God, and for that reason, he did not fear. And I want you to keep that word in mind, fear. David has experienced God's intervention, and he knows what victory feels like. When God calls us, we do not need to fear. We need to trust that God has equipped us with the tools that are needed to deal with the situation that we are given. David was not afraid to use his gifts. He saw other ways outside of being a shepherd to use his gifts. Now, too often we limit the use of our gifts, but God has equipped us to bring about our best. Our callings often go beyond the work of the church. One of the exciting things as a Christian is to take the work of the church outside of the walls of the church and to be the church on Monday that we claim to be on Sunday. Amen? Amen. Now I see a lot of heads nodding. That's a good thing. David's not the only person to come up against a giant. All believers, every one of us, will face challenges. Small challenges, big challenges, difficult challenges, seemingly impossible challenges. We will all face them. Then either one of two things will happen, either fear or faith. Most often it is fear and an expectation that we're going to get squashed, that we're not going to be able to handle it. What am I going to do? That's your fear talking. That's not your faith talking. If we look back to the story in 1 Kings, the story of Jezebel. Anybody know Jezebel? If you want to read a good story, read up on Jezebel. 
So we have Jezebel, and what a character she was. She was married to King Ahab, who ruled the kingdom of Israel, but she was opposed to worshiping Yahweh, but instead wanted everyone, including her husband, to worship Baal. Jezebel sent a message to Elijah, and it said, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. And them were the prophets, um, the prophets of Baal, who had all been killed. So in other words, Jezebel is telling Elijah, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be dead. Elijah believed her. Elijah got really afraid. He was scared for his life. So he ran. Scriptures, scriptures tell us he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, and the scripture says, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush, and he fell asleep. All at once, an angel touches him and says, get up and go eat. Now, as United Methodists, I think that's got to become our favorite verse. Get up and go eat, because we're all about the food, right? So he looks around, and there by his head were some bread and some baked, or some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. So he gets up, and he eats and drinks, and he lays back down and goes back to sleep. You see, no matter how afraid he was, God was with him. Just like no matter how afraid we are, God is with us. He equips us to handle all situations, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And yes, the painful ones. Not only did God send an angel once to Elijah, who was afraid, but listen to this next verse. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and go eat. Now this is my kind of angel. <laughs> get up and go eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached uh, Horeb, the mountain of God, which is also the mountain where Moses saw God. And there he went into a cave and he spent the night. And just as a side note, we have to look at the gifts that God gave Elijah to handle what he needed to handle. He gave him sleep, he gave him a ministering angel, and he gave him food. God was with him in his fear and provided everything he needed. You see, God is with us as well. No matter how many times we become frightened, no matter how afraid we are, no matter how many times we doubt, no matter how many times we walk in the wrong direction, God is with us, no matter how afraid we are. But I want to go back a few lines here to something I said a few minutes ago. When Elijah finally stopped running and he hid under the bush, what did he do? What did he say? I've had enough, Lord. He went to the Lord in prayer. Elijah went on to be one of the most famous and dramatic prophets in all of Israel that God used to be a fabulous representative of himself. One of the things that we can learn from Elijah and from David is how much they both trusted God. They both knew that God was with them in their battles and that God would use them for great things. What's that got to do with us? Where does that leave us? Well, David faced Goliath. Elijah faced his fear and the word of Jezebel. What do you face? As we search for what God is calling us to do, we will face obstacles. We will face different paths that will be put in front of us. Satan will work really, really hard, my friends, to deter you from following God's call. 
to block us from doing what God calls us to do. In our gathering words this morning, we talked about the power that we have. We must have power to overcome Satan and truly follow God's call. The power of trust was the first line in our um, call to worship, our opening words. The power of trust. Trust is a firm belief in the reliable truth, the ability or strength or someone to strengthen someone. You see, we have to trust with your entire being that God has your back and that he'll always, always be there for you. And that he will take care of you. He knows what is best for you. But to truly embrace what he has planned for you, you have to fully trust him. Our trust is not foolish. Our trust is not silly. Because our God is both faithful and good. James 1.6 says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Mark 9, 23 says, everything is possible for one who believes. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Then we pray for the power of hope. The New Testament idea of hope is, is different from them what we think of in the word hope. If someone were to ask, will the Eagles make him, so I have to relate it to football this time of the year, are the Eagles going to make the playoffs or the, you know, any further, how far are they going to go? And you're going to say, I don't know, but I sure hope so. Well, that kind of hope is the desire for something that you're uncertain about, that you're not quite sure is going to happen, but you're going to hope that it does. But this is not the way Peter or any of the New Testament thinks about hope. When Peter says in 1 Peter 1.13, hope fully in the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He does not mean that we should desire it or be uncertain of it. The coming of Christ is a matter of complete confidence for all the writers of the New Testament. So the command hope fully means intensely desirous and fully confident that Jesus Christ is coming again with grace for all his people. What a comfort. What a comfort that is, no matter what we're going through. We can then define hope in the New Testament sense as full assurance or strong confidence that God is going to do good to us in the future. Our gathering words also ask for the power of faith. Now, faith is the full assurance of things hoped for, for the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11, 1. Faith in God is a life-saving power. It's not just a feeling. It's a belief in the power that God has to save us from the uttermost sin, past, present, or future that we must fight to get a hold of and then fight to hold on to for our entire life. But when we lay hold of faith, we experience a tremendous power and that power that it has to change our life completely. So now that we have the power of trust, the power of hope, and the power of faith, I think the only thing that holds us back now is fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of failure, fear of maybe looking silly or embarrassing yourself, fear of we could be here for hours if we listed everything we could possibly be afraid of. When I thought about fear and how best to, to work on that topic, there's a song called Fear is a Liar. So every time I say the word he, I really mean fear. So listen to the lyrics. No, I'm not going to sing. Don't worry. I'm just going to read them. You all say it. When he, fear, told you you were not good enough, 
When fear told you you were not right, when fear told you you were not strong enough to put up a good fight, when fear told you you weren't worthy, when fear told you you were not loved, when fear told you you're not, you're not beautiful, that you'll never be enough, well, fear, he is a liar. He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. Fear, he is a liar. He will rob you of your rest. He will steal your happiness. Cast your fear in the fire because fear is a liar. When he told you you were trouble, you'll never be alone. You'll forever be alone. When he told you you should run away, you'll never find a home. When fear told you that you were dirty and that you should be ashamed, when fear told you you could not be the one that grace could never change, fear is a liar. Let faith be bigger than your fear because fear is a liar. You see what God calls you to? He will see you through. Fear is what Jezebel put in the heart of Elijah. Thankfully, even though Elijah had Jezebel in his head, he had God in his heart. David showed us the perfect example of having trust, hope, and faith in God as he answered his call and that it is possible to face all the Goliaths, all the giants, all of those in our life, because no matter how scary they are, no matter how big they are, my friends, our God is bigger. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us come together now and share the prayer that Jesus taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, will you please rise and join me in our final song, Shine, Jesus, Shine, number 2173 in the faith we sing, or the words will be on your screen.
next week, I realized what we're going to be talking about in answering our call is we're going to be talking about friendship. So how many of you have a friend? Okay, come on, everybody has their hand, has their hand up for that. But what I'm going to challenge you to do is invite your friend. Pastor Nicole talked about the invite bulletins. Invite your friend to come to church next Sunday so we can celebrate your friendship. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.